Hi, everyone. Welcome to Transform X 2022 Autonomous Vehicle Computer Vision Expert Panel. Today, we'll be talking about overcoming the most difficult challenges in autonomous vehicles. Super excited because we have an excellent superstar panel today. Um, with us, we have Alex, the CEO of WAVE, Drago, Distinguished Scientist and Head of Research at Waymo, Marco, the Director of Autonomous Vehicle Research at NVIDIA and Associate Professor at Stanford University. And my name is Kate, and I'm Staff AI Product Manager at Tesla. So we're going to go through a couple topics today, but just to kick off the first, um, yeah, it's October 2022, and it's actually been a decade since um, ImageNet and when AlexNet won ImageNet. So the first question is uh, to reflect on the last decade of deep learning and advances, and would self-driving be possible without deep learning? So maybe Drago, if you would like to start. So maybe I can start because I remember quite vividly when ImageNet came out uh, 10 years ago. And at the time I was at Google working on computer vision and we had two trends. One was with neural nets and one uh, with more classical models. And the classical models were winning, except uh, in many tasks, except on ImageNet at the time, our histogram of oriented gradients and deformable part model and whatnot got only 9% or so, which was very, very bad. And so it's one of the first data sets that brought scale to computer vision and of course brought AlexNet after it. And uh, I think this topic of large data sets for various domains and the models that can be trained from them has endured. And this was one of the first. So it was pretty monumental in that case. And I actually competed in ImageNet in 2014, and we won on the strength of DeepNet architectures at the time. And unlike many other contestants that tried to put smarts on top of Alex, AlexNet on around, or around it, we went for designing large architecture as big as possible. And that was partly also because our infrastructure did not allow us easily to do other things. So we went with it, but we also felt that's a good direction. And so I think a lot of these trends that ImageNet started are still alive today. Uh, large models trained on a lot of data, only now the scales have changed dramatically. And so, uh, yeah, it's a seminal, seminal uh, data set. I think there's a couple of things we can learn from ImageNet. So when we started WAVE in 2017, uh, we made the bet that end-to-end -end deep learning would be what is really going to take autonomous driving to the next level. And that's exactly what we saw in ImageNet. It was when end-to-end -end deep learning uh, came to the necessary scale, it was was really able to unlock the performance that, that has really led to a lot of the breakthroughs we've seen in the field of AI today. Now, the the interesting thing is is why, has, why, why has it taken a delay between ImageNet reaching that point in 2012, when are we going to see that in autonomous driving? I, I think one of the learnings there is that although convolutional nets have been around since, say, the 1980s, it actually took until that point with the compute and and really having the right data and benchmarks in place, I'd argue. And, and that was really what ImageNet gave us, is the data and the benchmarks to be able to iterate on this problem. So it's an interesting parallel of how would we get that in the field of autonomous driving. Um, I think that's that's really one of the keys that, that will be able to unlock um, the right thing here is having the right problem, the right, the right data. But ultimately, if there's anything we can learn from ImageNet, I think the result is going to be fairly similar in robotics. Only and, robotics. Oh, sorry. And what ImageNet kicked off is not just the impetus on deep learning, but the entire ecosystem around it. So compute availability of data sets, engineers being trained specifically for deep learning applications. So all of this has really catalyzed the application of deep learning to uh, vehicle autonomy. And to me personally, ImageNet and the early work in deep learning, which I got the chance to participate in in computer vision, it actually was foundational for me going into autonomy because before I felt that uh, deep learning and computer vision really can work which probably happened in the first part of the uh, 19, uh, 20, 2010s, uh, I did not think that self-driving cars would materialize without this technology. So actually, for 10 years, I stayed away from the domain. But uh, ImageNet and all the computer vision work, typically initially on more 2D models at the time, uh, gave me the confidence that it's time to go. 
And Alex, you're saying that there was a pretty big gap between 1980 and 2012. So are, do you think that gap we needed again for the latest technologies or now that we've set up all the compute and data pipelines and I guess foundations, we can just accelerate off of that? Yeah, well, hey, one of the interesting things is that for some time after 2012, we still saw a lot of breakthroughs come from ImageNet. So to cite a few examples, we had residual connections and ResNets <clears throat> or technologies like uh, ideas like batch normalization that were ideas that really pushed forward the field of deep learning. And I'd argue only in the last couple of years have we seen the frontier really perhaps move away from ImageNet and computer vision and maybe towards natural language processing and you know, the advent of transformers and, and, and uh, some of the approaches today. So it has it did drive a lot of um, you know, a lot of ideas, particularly through the early 2010s. Um, but I think across the board, you tend to see it's the, the data and the validation benchmarks and the challenges that catalyze breakthroughs, not the algorithms, which, which tend to come, come much earlier. Um, that's the pattern that I've tended to see in, in, uh, with, with data sets. And so with, with autonomous driving, the, the challenge is that when you operate in a dynamic world, you can't create a static train and test set, right? The, the world is always changing. Every time we go out for a drive, even if you do the same route, the environment's going to be entirely different. Um, so that's, I think, the challenge. And whether we look to simulation or whether we look to more dynamic data sets, uh, I think if we get that right, that's what I think could produce the, the magic that we saw with ImageNet. But to your question, Kate, I think what is really amazing is how the lag between innovations and then feeding those innovations into a safety critical system, such as an autonomous car, has shrunk dramatically. Like it took several years for deep learning to really become mainstream in the automotive world because of skepticism, because there was no availability of a large enough AI infrastructure. But today we see that like new things in the uh, machine learning world, like transformers and large scale uh, language models, as Alex mentioned, are already being adopted in, by autonomous driving companies with very small lag. If you take into account that an autonomous car is a safety critical system with lives at stake. But do we see this in autonomous driving as well? Remember when I when we started Wave in 2017, looking to use an end-to-end -end deep learning method for autonomous driving, many folks in the industry laughed at us and said, look, no way that will work. It won't be interpretable. It won't be able to be safe. And, uh, and actually, autonomy is a year away and people raised a billion dollars to go and do that. And actually what we've seen is that skepticism has changed. And now I, I see a lot of support for the kind of ideas that, um, the, these kind of ideas for the industry. I mean, I would say that uh, to me, what's interesting is uh, the state of the art and the technology and uh, deep learning and our capabilities with modeling continues improving at a very brisk pace. Like there's foundational advances that continue occurring which is pretty fascinating. Uh, and with Transformers, with Nerf now, um, penetrating our domain. And that's not something that was easily predicted. And I think the other part that's happening in AVs is, uh, I would say the adoption of a lot of these new technologies is very fast. And at this point, all parts of the cell driving stack, all major systems rely on uh, powerful ML models. And just a few years ago, that wasn't quite true. Yeah, great. Um, we've mentioned uh, yeah end-to-end -end learning a couple times, so let's dig a little bit more into that. So traditionally, we've seen many self-driving companies approach self-driving in more of a modular approach. You've got computer vision, perception, planning and controls, validation. But then what some folks are doing, I think actually both Waymo and um, Wave are exploring this is more end-to-end. -end. And then maybe actually we should start with Marco for NVIDIA, what your approach is, what you think about end-to-end -end versus modular. Then we can go to Alex on end to end and then Drago, which one are you guys going to pursue both? Well, I mean, typically modular architectures are uh, um, compared directly against the uh, end to learn approaches. The reality is that there is a continuum between uh, these two uh, architectural choices. I see them as two ends of a spectrum. Of course, there are multiple ways in which you can uh, inject deep learning into the autonomy stack. Of course, perception and a prediction, but maybe trajectory optimization can rely on more optimization-based techniques. And something that, for example, people are exploring, including us at NVIDIA, is the idea of differentiable stacks. So making even components that are not neural net based 
differentiable so that they can be jointly trained with data along with other modules. So the key point here is that oftentimes the debate is simplified into end-to-end -end versus modular. The reality is that there is a continuum and different companies exploring this continuum in different ways. I think uh, modules are here to stay. They're a key way to decompose the problem in general. I mean, of course, there's one simple way in which you stay is you have intermediate outputs that you try to understand how your system is performing on a set of tasks, like does it understand the road, can it detect the objects, and so on. Uh, you can, the question generally for modularity is, you can, can you also train all these modules end to end, pass rich internal state? Uh, there is certain pros and cons here, and I think going to my experience is uh, going to an extreme often uh, is uh, difficult, end to end being one extreme and having too many modules being the other, right? And so there is a clear trend of having fewer modules, uh, having larger modules that do more and more tasks as, as models. Uh, but, uh, you know, going out end to end also has difficulties. And I think there are certain advantages models uh, bring about uh, engineering ease and parallelism, inspecting outcomes, allowing humans to, interve to intervene uh, based on understandable model output if, if the model goes out of domain. Uh, it facilitates also mining independently data for various corner cases, which is harder to do in a, a monolithic setting and controlling the, the behavior of the parts of the model is easier, right? On the other hand, of course, the back propagation uh, involves humans. It, it can involve like the design of an API that is human specified and can lose data. And so such so trades, trade-offs, I think, uh, uh, involved. Another interesting question when you go all the way into end, Alex, is right, when you say have 20 plus cameras and maybe some other sensors, LiDAR, radar, that's a lot of sensors. And so always applying, creating such a big model that can ingest all these sensors, reason over data for a very long period of time, right? And evaluation now requires you simulating all these sensors, leads you to a lot of computational cost and, and uh, generally big data center and complexity. And so, so there are these competing trends. So to me, they're a bit extremes. We're mo moving to fewer and fewer models, but when you should move all the way to one model, say, is still uh, an open question. Yeah, that's the last, that last point is a really good one around the added complexity of, of having more and more input data. But look, I think it's a binary difference between a modular and an end-to-end -end stack. Traditional approaches to autonomous vehicles that have modular stacks, what we're seeing over the last five years is a trend where more and more components are being replaced with machine learning. And, and as you mentioned, Drago, like, Basically, all of them are powered by machine learning today. But if you have a lossy human defined and enumerated interface between these, that really holds you back from getting the most efficient and effective representation out. It means that you have teams that are individually optimizing each part of the stack. Uh, and this means that you need thousands of engineers and, and quite an um, unwieldy uh, cycle to be able to iterate on this and do change management of these modules. The beauty of having an end-to-end -end stack is it's one single model where updates to that come from learning and data where it's all, um, it can be automatic and scalable. Going back to the ImageNet example at the start, if you tried to approach ImageNet with a modular method today, you'd be laughed at. And I think I'd ask the question, what, what, what is different about autonomous driving that, that doesn't make that true here too? I would just say, though, the ImageNet example, it's a lot simpler domain, right? You have a single image, 256 by 256 pixels. I think a lot of abstractions do not need to be extracted. The model, all, often, if you look at the winning models, at least in the past, they will look at some local patterns and textures and not necessarily even extract long-ranging correlations or geometry. I think that the scale that we're dealing with in terms of amount of data we need to process, sensors, pixels, and the complexity of reasoning we put on top is completely different orders of magnitude, right? And so that drives us. I mean, while ImageNet is some inspiration, it's a very early toy problem compared to everything we're dealing with. So, so if we're limited by data and compute and complexity around that, I guess, say, in 30 or 50 years' time, Drago, do you think that when we have the compute and data we have in 50 years' time, modular systems will still exist for autonomous driving? 
I think as models and intermediate outputs will always exist, right? I think if the question is how much of the stack can you back propagate through to, to accelerate, I think this is a trend that will continue, right? It's only a question relative to the hardware uh, capabilities and how much you can control these models effectively to satisfy the long tail drives, how much of that you can consolidate. And it's a, it's a normal trend, but, uh, you know, it's still playing out. And of course, the choice of the right uh, architecture also depends on the target use case, whether someone wants to pursue safety certification or not, what type of uh, vehicle you want to deploy your system over. Do you already have all the data that you need in order to train an end-to-end -end architecture? So yes, I'm more on the side of the modules are probably going to stay, but with the idea that are going to are going to jointly be trained with data with interfaces that also might be trained with data. That's an interesting point because what we actually see with our end-to-end -end approach is that I mean, deep learning is the best technology that I'm aware of at the ability to generalize. And what I mean by that is being able to deal with new data points that haven't seen, been seen before. And that's true all the time in autonomous driving. Every time you go driving, you're seeing something new. You're never going to see the same thing twice. And whether it's a new scenario, a new route, a new weather pattern, or even a new city or a new vehicle, um, I think what we're seeing in, in machine learning is the advent of large-scale foundation models, models that really understand representations in general. And you could cite some of the large language models as a, as a, for, as a good example here. And I think what is going to get autonomous driving to scale is a similar model for robotics, a large-scale foundation model that understands the dynamics of, of urban scenes, of driving scenarios um, that can generalize to new vehicles and new cities that hasn't been foreseen before because of the experience it has, can learn from all of those experiences. That's the vision that I think is not 50 years away, but it's something that we can build today and we are working on at Wave. Um, I think this is what's gonna, gonna, gonna solve the challenges that we see in the industry today. Okay, well, thank you for talking about foundation models because I want to talk about data. This is something very near and dear to um, my career and obviously self-driving cars. So with the advent of yeah, large language models, um, you know, GPT or um, larger foundation models, there's a lot more emphasis on self-supervised learning and efficient fine tuning. So how much do large labeled data sets matter now? And um, if, maybe more specifically, if you do have an end-to-end -end system, what does the data mining pipeline look like? Should I start? Um, Go for it. I can have a, a few points. I think uh, large data sets still matter. Um, you want to start by training some models and then bootstrapping. And so, you know, in academia often it's popular to potentially try how much can you learn without any annotations. We don't have to go there. Right, you have some models, and it and it results in a fairly standard machine learning uh, iteration cycle. So you train some models, you deploy them in the world, you collect data, you check where in that collected data these models maybe don't perform as you want. Then you go mine more of this data, maybe change the models to to respect those cases in the design, and then you repeat. And so so that is a standard iteration cycle. I think what is changing is potentially one paradigm, which is first, transformer models tend to have great scaling and generalization properties. Uh, second, once that's available off board, you can train really big models, uh, potentially ensembles of models that then maybe you want to distill on board. And that's a really great way to uh, ultimately fit under the latency constraint, but enjoy the benefits of scaling, multitask, uh, ultimately training with less labels, the bigger model you can train Right on more tasks, you can train it with consistency, with self supervision, with you know masking knockouts. I mean, there's a whole bunch of technologies developed. The more you can do that, the stronger the model gets, and then you, you try to distill as much of that model into the system that actually runs real time. So that's a paradigm. It's quite standard to a lot of the machine learning domains. The only difference is maybe if we have a lot of different outputs and different parts of the system have different properties, you may want to apply uh slightly different techniques for example um you know the early parts of the system often you can train uh quite strongly in a supervised way um right and test in a supervised way uh towards uh, the end where planning and control is concerned you want ultimately to train uh potentially test uh train but also uh, uh sorry i mean you would you would want to at least test closed loop uh on long-term uh behavior 
and potentially even train closed loop if uh, if uh, you can afford to do that. And so um, there's some difficulty uh, or change compared to the standard machine pipeline is that you may want to build a simulator to do this for the latter parts of the system, but otherwise it's quite standard, I would say. The other thing that's changed is the ability to use task agnostic data. So, you know, five years ago, if you wanted to train a semantic segmentation or an object detection system, you would train it purely on data for that task. But now we're seeing a huge change in the ability to throw the text from Wikipedia into the model to improve the performance of that. Um, and I think this means that the diversity of labeled data and the ability to leverage different learning signals has just exploded. Uh, that means creating learning loops of human labeled data at scale uh, is you know, becoming less and less of the most effective way to, to solve this problem. And more broadly, the availability of data is going to skyrocket, right? So for example, uh, one of the advantages of Tesla is to really gather data at scale through the fleet. It's in many ways, Impedia has a similar strategy through the partnership with uh, automotive companies such as Mercedes. The idea is to soon start gathering data at scale on millions of vehicles and really turn the problem almost into an ML ops problem, if you like. So this is something that was even unconceivable a few years ago. So then if there's less emphasis on human labeled data sets, at least for uh, very clear supervised tasks, um, what do you think scale should focus on? They obviously do many, many things. They also build platforms and they're renowned for um, auto labeled data set simulation. Do you have any thoughts on where the future of data company should go? So I think labeling the long tail examples is still valuable, right? I don't think we've automated that away. I think what we're automating away is uh, the vast majority of the head and torso of the, of the tasks and also potentially the discovery of these rare examples. But from labeling them and understanding where they are uh, is still a fundamental problem, uh, right? So, so there's still, scale, scales can still do well helping us label the long tail, it's pretty long, right? But a lot of the other parts of the pipeline, uh, there's hope to automate uh, maximally with uh, machine learning techniques. Totally agree. So labeling for the long tail is uh, absolutely imperative, but also labeling is just one part of a larger AI infrastructure. Uh, storing the data, retaining the data, dividing the data in different work workflows for development and validation. Those are all additional tasks that require a lot of work and a lot of investment. Yeah, I think the statement machine learning is 90% a data engineering problem is, is something that we all, all know is true. Uh, and that understanding and analyzing data sets is hugely valuable. I, you know, a way if we love the scale nucleus tool, I think this is fantastic at really understanding the data that you have. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is the future of data management analysis. Great. And what do you think about open sourcing data uh, data sets and research? Uh, Waymo has actually done this in the past, and um, how much has it actually helped the development? Um, you know, whether it's recruiting or pointing academia in the right direction, and do others have plans to do similar open source challenges? Well, let me put my Stanford hat here. This has been hugely valuable. Uh, like, for example, a lot of the work that has been done in the past, uh, I would say, three, four years on prediction algorithm, trajectory forecasting algorithms, to a large extent, was facilitated by the availability of data sets such as those from Weibo, Waymo or Newtonum Emotional. Without that, most likely we wouldn't have seen such a, a, a focus on this class of problems. Yeah, thank you, Marco. I mean, I worked hard to make sure that data set becomes a reality. And it was really driven by my own experience in the AV space. So early on, I mean, Kit is a seminal work and it's a small by current standards of autonomous driving data set. And my experience was that, you know, when we train models, because it's so small, it turns into an exercise in not overfitting. And I think uh, that also distorts what models actually perform well. Uh, and so with more data, other models start dominating in many cases. And so I felt that the field will start drawing incorrect conclusions or developing the wrong types of things. And so we felt that a much larger data sets uh, 
were needed. And so we released the open data set, the Waymo open data set has close to 2000 run segments. Now, what we found there is that, and this is part of the interesting properties of the stack, early parts of the stack, you can actually train pretty good perception models, say for detection of segmentation with tens of thousands to maybe 1 million sequences. Just every 20 seconds have, you know, maybe a hundred objects at 10 hertz uh, for 20 seconds. That's tens of thousands of examples in one sequence. While that whole sequence may or may not have an interesting interaction. And so that really motivated then if we had to release a practical data set to give 100,000 of them, but in a symbolic intermediate representation produced by a perception system. And I think that was... That was important to do. It's very difficult to release sensor data uh, publicly for 100,000 sequences, but this unlocks like chaining of these uh, examples and shows the different needs of different parts of the model as well. Uh, but uh, to us, it's a way, probably the most productive way to engage academia in the problems in, in formulations that are more relevant, we believed, uh, than potentially what they could do before. And hopefully this benefits uh, the whole field. And we continue releasing new outputs like 2D and 3D segmentation, now 2D and 3D key points that help you learn a bit more about, uh, you guys talked how all these tasks now, they interrelate and maybe we can train multitask models. And there's this question, if you have intermediate interfaces, what they are and how they relate to the quality of the final tasks. If we release more, if we release more of these outputs, the community can do more of this type of research, which until now, has been difficult to do too. And it's fundamental. How do you build your stack? Like if there's modules, what they are, if there is intermediate representation, what, what are they? Like, how do they compare? Right? So we try to help more with this, which I think is a, I guess, a direction of interest and should be, should be a topic for a lot of people to, the, to explore further. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is such a large problem that open and collaborative development is much more effective. Uh, so at wave. Uh, we have open source code, we collaborate with many universities, uh, and we publish a number of research papers every year. So how, I guess, yeah, open source code, I mean, how much do you open source without giving away your business advantage? You're, you still want to get to market, I assume, somewhat first. What is your philosophy there, Alex? The reality is that things are moving so fast here. By the time you've open sourced something that you've moved on to, to the next idea. Um, I think the benefit of open sourcing is, is it gives you um, peer review, it lets others build off ideas and it, it, and it can um, you know, attract critical mass behind an, an approach you're taking. And I think this can be really powerful and, and generate flywheels. I think you have people here who have all published, right? I think, yes. Yeah, pretty much all my work at NVIDIA Research is uh, published and open sourced. And Marco, have you uh, seen concrete gains from it? There are two types of gains. Uh, the first one is engaging academia in focusing on problems that uh, uh, we think are fundamental in order to advance the field. And uh, the way more open data set is a case in point. But the second one is honestly building a pipeline of engineers that hopefully would be joining uh, the organization in the future. So basically having a pipeline of engineers that are already skilled on the problems that uh, we care about. And the reality is that these are really tough problems that require uh, you know, cutting edge knowledge on a number of different fields. And so the pool of talent is restricted and the fact that we can actually train these people on the problems we care about is of paramount importance. But open sourcing doesn't come without a cost. To address your question, case. I mean, open sourcing will come with a, a ton of support, and you have to package it and make it and um, take it out of your internal infrastructure. I mean, you know, there is a world where we could open source our internal simulator, uh, but uh, actually doing that practically, given the compute infrastructure required, is actually very difficult in itself. Talking about data sets, I mean, yeah, the cityscapes and kitty data sets that maybe I worked with my P in my PhD, they're what, hundreds of gigabytes, but the data sets we work with today are petabytes. And how do you host and download those? There's some really practical challenges around doing this. So I think you've got to pick and choose and certain algorithmic advances uh, or drivers or other you know, set pieces of things is what, what we've found as an effective medium here. And for us, I think a lot of these papers that we publish, right, they're a specific advance in a specific area. And it 
it's a great example to show strong work at Waymo and that we're a leader in technology in this field and that attracts strong talent and also having an outlet to publish papers encourages people to take more risks, right? So there can be many reasons why an innovation may not be easily deployable in the current system for practical constraints at the moment, but you can still have another outlet to show strong contributions and work. So that helps. And uh, generally the research team at WEMO is known as internally as the applied research team. And uh, as you guys said, the technology moves so quickly, we get to explore some of these new trends and their applications to our problems. And the production teams benefit too, because they get, first of all, early look at all of our uh, achievements. Uh, usually they get, you know, get to see them a lot sooner than by the time the processing process, the publishing process carries through. Also, they get to work with the people that made these advances directly to, to deploy to the system. And so it, it generates a very, uh, productive, positive uh, cycle where the advances feed the systems, the system evolution feeds ideas for advances. And, uh, and you, you need to have people that are really strong, want to explore and willing to take risks. So, so publication is, helps towards establishing this cycle. Great. Um, want to circle back to simulation since it's come up a couple times in your responses. What do you think the role of SIM is? Is it just for evaluation? Should it be trained on? How do you compare it to real world data? Hey, um, maybe let me start. So what, what we've developed at WAVE is a internal simulator that's uh, incredibly scalable. It simulates the entire robot and the environment through procedural and neural rendering. Um, it gives us a very large scale and um, you know, procedurally diverse environment to test in, but not only for testing and validation and measurement, um, but also for training and generating synthetic training data. Um, I think simulation is a really, really core technology. If we want to um, build safety cases and deploy updates to our, our fleet, you know, with over there updates in days, rather than spending months and months generating rigorous safety statistics on the road, the only way to do that, in my opinion, is, is, is through simulation. Um, so it's a very, very core part of both how we train end-to-end uh, -end driving policies and and measure their performance at WAVE, uh, and I, th I think is a, a real key to iterating quickly here. Well, simulation in general is the holy grail in robotics, especially given uh, the trend in using increasingly more uh, learning uh, tools. Simplifying, I think simulation has three main pillars. Simulating the vehicle that you know is relatively straightforward, at least for autonomous cars. Um, stimulating the sensors, which is hard, but I think that uh, by now the community knows how to do that pretty well. And uh, simulating the humans, and that is still quite challenging. And we would like to simulate all the nuanced ways humans, like pedestrians, bikers, human drivers, could react to autonomous cars in a way that we can enable, I mean, the ultimate goal, you'd like to enable closed loop training. I think we're still a bit far for really having uh, simulated human models that really replicate the, all the nuanced ways that people in Italy from where I'm from could drive. But that doesn't mean simulation is not useful. As I said, it's even in its current state, it's super useful for development. The next challenge is to see to what extent it's really useful for uh, validation. Of course, in is having investing in simulation, the flagship product here will be DriveSim. And I'm pretty excited about the research opportunities, the potential that simulation might offer in the years to come. I think that there are many technologies that might really uh, get us to where we want to be with autonomous driving. I think simulation is one of the key ones. It's the most foundational to scaling, right? Um, and generally foundational for the task. And to me, what is really exciting is that Machine learning seems to be a fantastic tool to develop good simulation. We have been doing a lot of research, both with models like NERV to have neural simulator that say can simulate camera pixels well. Um, and of course you can train agent models with machine learning. And we have been working on this for years and have some papers uh, demonstrating that with imitation learning, you can already go a long way into designing agent models. And I would say that even 
uh, agent models and modeling behavior with high fidelity is more important than modeling the sensors and the pixels because a lot of the difficulty in driving comes from interacting with pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles. I think we're pretty good not hitting things that are static, but uh, a lot of the complexity comes from uh, the humans in the environment. And therefore, it's imperative to model them Otherwise, the outcomes in the simulator will not be realistic. And so we're moving to this simulator realism. And I think AV is a fantastic space where we can hill climb on simulator realism with machine learning and uh, better and potentially better set up than many other fields. And we were talking before about the role of machine learning. I think data driven models for human agents is yet another example where deep learning is becoming the standard. Until just a few years ago, People were using analytical models, right, for simulation. Now it's basically mostly data-driven models, but there's still the question of uh, how do you handle how to distribution events, how do you really extend these models to different areas of the world, how you control the simulation toward those scenarios that you really care about, and so on and so forth. So I think this is a pretty exciting area for development. So it sounds like simulation is still, uh, or there's still an open question about even figuring out what to simulate, what scenarios in the world all edge cases of the world. So does that mean there is strong priority on these partnerships, um, you know, Wave and NVIDIA with Mercedes or um, other companies, and then Waymo getting the product actually in the hands of customers so that you can get those validation edge cases? Yeah, well, if, I guess it's a true statement. If you, if you solve simulation, you've solved autonomous driving, and in many ways there is a harder problem as each other. Um, and in terms of getting the, the the data, I mean, if you take real world examples and look to re-simulate or augment them, that's one approach at letting you explore um, areas, uh, I guess, different permutations and combinations near what you've experienced in the real world. But then there's other, um, you know, to get a very exhaustive coverage of the ODD and be confident in your, in your behavior, then it can also be helpful to, uh, I guess, create um, simulations from scratch. Uh, and being able to to proceed to generate. And I think both approaches are helpful and complementary. And there's an intermediate situation where you start with sensor data you collected and you play out many possible futures. That's also a very powerful paradigm. I mean, and generally I would say simulation works, right? At Waymo, we run 20 million miles every day and we derive uh, a ton of value from doing so in evolving our system. Uh, all this technology we're talking about just helps scale this effort. It's quite effort intensive, uh, developing good simulations. It helps us scale to new environments it's, uh, as we keep driving them and getting examples of them, I think. And the simulator itself is a powerful scaling tool in your experience because if you can start replaying uh, scenarios and derive a multitude of different outcomes, even from a single starting point. You have multiple because people are non-deterministic in the environment, so they can play out different behaviors relative to what you do. You can multiply your learning dramatically. And so, so we're still working on unlocking all this power of scaling from the simulator, but it's already highly helpful in current state. Great. Well, we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, I want to close with going a little bit more macro level and just ask what challenges are you working on now um, as you work on your autonomous vehicle systems? So maybe I can take a stab. I mean, I think uh, may, it may be good to state where are we, at least as a company, uh, and what have we achieved, right? And then talk about the challenges. Um, Waymo has been operating uh, fully driverless service, uh, the world's first in uh, Chandler, uh, Phoenix East Valley since 2020 at scale. Uh, and this continues. And this year we started driverless operation in two cities, uh, San Francisco and Phoenix with uh, uh, some with way more employees and um, a, a trusted tester like service in those locations with uh, with actual uh, you know members of our early program. And so we have achieved already driverless service at some scale in some very complex cities like San Francisco and Phoenix downtown with the same system actually at a fairly 
rapid clip uh, since uh, we introduced our fifth generation vehicle in early 2021 and we're already giving driverless rides to our employees every day in a significant part of San Francisco. So the rate of iteration is very quick. Now, there is a question why, well, and weren't you already at scale in the full city with everybody? Well, uh, just as in early in Phoenix when we did it, it's a thoughtful rollout that starts with a trusted test service, get their experience, understand how your system behaves in these environments, right? And then thoughtfully increase the scale as we go. Over time, as we get more and more confidence, we keep increasing the scale. And this is a process that's playing out now in San Francisco and Phoenix. And some, of course, of the hard challenges is, you know, in San Francisco, we had to address hills, which is uh, pretty in good shape. There's construction, always very fascinating challenge. There's things like, you know, extreme weather. So there's still things we're working on, but there's these things are already out there and the, the pace of improvement and generally uh, scale of driverless continues now to many cities at some scale. And I hope that we can open it up to more and more people in larger and larger scope. Uh, at least that's the trajectory we are on. Um, yeah, the, the thing that surprised me the most is the just the sheer diversity of things that you see on the road. But um, what we focus on next, I mean, it is to continue this theme. It's entirely about scale. You know, we care about how do we build a system that can get to over a hundred cities, um, and in particular, how can we build something that trains on millions of hours of data, petabytes of data, with billions of parameters in a neural network that can learn uh, in a way that we can. Can, can produce something with the intelligence to be able to deliver that future. So it's, it's really all about pushing that forward. Yeah, I agree. One of the major challenges is the challenge of scale uh, in terms of both improving performance of the models, but also improving the performance, uh, trying to keep development costs at a, a reasonable pace. So for example, improvement in simulation or better architectures, as we discussed before, or in general architectures that make better use of data. I think these are still uh, interesting open challenges. But that, I mean, all the promise of machine learning already bearing dividends because we're talking about a single system driving all these cities, right? And it's not like tuning anyone into a separate city or domain. We're, we're talking build one system that can do it all, highway, uh, downtown, suburbia. Now we're talking well, the truck in the Waymo case, right? So we share a ton of systems and in some cases, the full models, uh, certainly sharing the data between car and truck when we train. There is a lot of synergy even across different vehicle types that is highly beneficial. So this already benefits machine learning has brought to our field and this seems to be the right way to develop. Uh, awesome. Bonus question here. Obviously we're all working on you know autonomous systems. It's definitely wonderful for the world, um, safety, efficiency, et cetera. But if you had to design um, a hiding spot from self-driving cars, how would you design the spot? Would it be es esoteric signs, potholes everywhere, covered in mist and fog? Any thoughts? Well, you've got to do something truly adversarial. How do you get well outside the training data set? I think there is this um, open domain problem. You can think of it, at least in perception, it's easier to explain. You train a model and then you have maybe an infinite stream of data. Go find all the interesting rare cases. Show that you can do well on things you've never seen before. That's one way to uh, to formulate uh, the problem. Uh, yeah. Not many self-driving cars are good looking up. So we got to hide in the trees. I, I think in terms of simulation, also very promising to think of uh, like you want you want li somewhat likely and adversarial cases. So you don't want completely adversarial behavior because obviously uh, that's, you're not gonna make much progress in the city if everyone rushes to, to run into you, right? But so you want likely things and you want to find and sample them, even as behaviors, but have some idea of how common they are and correct for it. And so you want to be able to simulation, not necessarily just run until you can like IID sample events. You may want to build it such that it, you can induce it to create interesting scenarios. And this is knobs you can turn, things coming out of occlusion.
or adversarial but likely behaviors or things of this sort. So I think I think that's also a good way to look at the, at the problem on the behavior side. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marco, Alex, Drago. It was amazing to hear from you. And of course, thank you, Scale, for having all of us. Um, yeah. And also thank you for all the work you do. I think we're very excited for the future and um, hope people join, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.